Hello, uh, back again. Um, this is about the fifth time I've tried to make this video, so we're going to miss the preamble. It's straight into the Church of the Dispossessed. This is a work uh, in progress that I have been considering for some years, and uh, we're now going for. There's a light flashing now, I don't know what it means. The Church of the Dispossessed. Why the Church of the Dispossessed? According to Compassion UK, there are 6.02 uh, million regular churchgoers in the UK. All references will be down below in the, yeah, the uh, video description. That's the one. Unfortunately, there is no date on this article, but The Guardian of January 2016 reports that attendance in the Church of England had dropped below the 1 million, falling to 760,000, or approximately 1.3% of the population. Yet data from the Office of National Statistics, I'd like to say that one, in 2011 gives 59.3% of the population identifying as Christian. This is the largest religious group in the UK, the second largest group being Islam at 4.8%. So, overwhelmingly the largest group, with around uh, 38.2 million people claiming to be Christian, and yet, of that 38.2 million, less than 2% regularly attend church. The World Council of Churches gives the Church of England membership at 25 million. Working from these figures, only 3% regularly attend church. In 2017, the article, uh, the Independent published an article, as opposed to the article publishing an Independent, which is what I nearly said, stating more than half of the British public, 53%, say they are not at all religious. A figure that has increased by 5 percentage points since 2015 and by 19 percentage points since 2083, when just 3 in 10 people deem themselves non-religious. This need not be a shocking revelation, but it's certainly a wake-up call. Not at all religious does not equate to being atheist. It is a phrase that can mean anyone a number of things, from I don't understand this church thing, through maybe some sort of creative being out there somewhere, or I don't want to talk about it, which I think is very often the case, actually, to there is no God. It is an indicator that organised religion is failing. Repossessing the forgotten, and this is something that's actually quite important. This is nicked, the, the opening reading is nicked from, um, blatantly stolen, from uh, the Reverend Professor Alan Brent's um, website. Uh, Alan Brent is one of the world's leading church historians. Uh, if you've ever studied church history, you should know the name. Uh, he also practiced an act active ministry in North Queensland back in the early 80s, or through the 80s. And this resulted in an amazing thing happening in Australia, uh, and a reforming at least of part of the church's structure, which was beneficial. Some children were playing in school at Yarraba, painting leaves that they pressed together and pulled apart. When they did so, they saw the face of Christ in the leaf. Thus was proclaimed the day that King Jesus came to Yaraba. There was, of course, in our European Enlightenment perspective, considerable criticism of this development, reminiscent of medieval cults and superstition. In Brent's opinion, expressed... Something keeps opening and annoying me. In Brent's opinion, expressed in a speech to the Synod of the Anglican Church in North Queensland, such criticism missed the point. The figure of Christ bears ident identifiable Aboriginal features and portrays a Christ that comes wearing the flesh and blood of Aboriginal humanity. 
the word was made flesh in human cultures and therefore ministerial order that represents an iconography of the divine will inev inevitably and be partially expressed in a cultural form. On that day a new door opened. The arrival of King Jesus in Yarraba signalled a new way of thinking. It is easy for white Westerners to dismiss this notion of Jesus in Aboriginal form when we are, and always have been, surrounded by a white Western Jesus. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus, still common in our iconography, bears little resemblance to the historical truth, but is comfortable to so many. Yet an Aboriginal Jesus became the subject of ridicule. If we look at Christian iconography from other cultures, we see distinctive features of that culture, often combined with a more traditional Western iconographic features. If the divine manifests itself so readily with distinctive cultural features, is it not entirely reasonable to expect this phenomenon to extend to the subcultures contained within the parent culture? And we look at man-centred church because it's a controversial title. And this is going out the window in a minute. The Church of England has done a good trade in comfy church, so beautifully summed up by John Betjeman. A Church of England sound, it tells of moderate worship, God and state, where Matins congregations go, conservative and good and slow, to elevations of the plate. That's from Church of England thoughts occasioned by hearing the bells of Magdalen Tower from the Botanic Gardens, Oxford, on St Mary Magdalene's Day. The title is nearly as long as the poem. The image, that is easy to see in the mind's eye. Uh, safe church, no popery, simple and unchanging, free from challenge. God is here, God is there, up there somewhere, we're here. We don't meet. But this is not all. Betjeman continues. And loud through resin scented in And loud through resin scented chines and purple rhododendrons rolled, I hear the bells for Eucharist from churches blue with incense mist, where Rayados's twinkle gold. And a different image comes to mind. A royal priesthood clad in purple processes in a cloud of prayer wafted up on high by the fragrant incense smoke. Rayadoses and stations of the cross adorned with gold. God and people are one in Jesus Christ, incarnate in the bread and wine. Each of these images is alien to the other. There are two different traditions that often view each other with suspicion, to put it mildly. The first place is God high in heaven, while the people remain not on the earth. We look up at God's greatness and we pray that God will be kind to us, show mercy and reveal his greatness. And it reflects very nicely Psalm 67. God be merciful unto us. And, uh, I, can't, I, can't, I can't remember it. It starts off God be merciful unto us. It's very popular at weddings at one time. This is transcendental theology. God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The second is incarnational theology, God in the here and now. Although complex and mysterious, when stripped to the basics, God is here and uh, typical, I've got lost. Complex and mysterious, when stripped to the basics, we are left with something very similar to the leaf painting at Yarraba. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Is it accidental that both quotes appear in the same gospel? The presence of two phrases that have been so divisive within the same gospel may be coincidental, but it can also be a clear indicator or sign of unity. In these two short passages, the transcendental God and the incarnational God become one. The nature of the divine becomes secondary to the perception of that nature within a community, and the perception will be influenced by cultural heritage of that community. The day King Jesus appeared to the Aboriginal people was the day the divine became incarnate in the same people. If the divine can be so clearly expressed in cultural features of a community, then it's entirely reasonable for it to be clearly expressed in the defining features 
of the subcultures contained with, within that community. The events at Yaraba do more than just show cultural flexibility of the divine, they also demonstrate a new pattern of learning. Let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's a famous, famous Pope quote from the Gospels. Look it up. If you don't know it, you should do. Yaraba is almost an inversion of this passage. It takes this passage, it forces it through itself, turns it round, pulls it back out through the middle and ends up the other way around. It's quite good, quite, quite clever. The, it is the children who make the leaf painting, interpret the image as the face of Jesus and relay the good news. In this story, the kingdom of heaven truly belongs to the children. The word made flesh is manifest to them and it is they who become the apostles to the adults. It is all too easy to consider the children of Yaraba and the impact of their image in the community of, in a culturally simplistic simplicity and imply that simplicity to all cultures. This of course would be to neglect the obvious teaching of the story. There is a distinct difference between adult and youth. The adults at first did not see the leaf painting, Jesus. It is important that we listen to the young and learn from them. King Jesus came to Yaraba through the young, immature and open-minded. A diverse confirmation, just to confuse you. Youth culture is seen in many ways and is often seen as a rebellion against the establishment. We kind of know that. There may be a case, and it well, may be well deserved actually, uh, it may also be a natural part of growing up, uh, a part of finding yourself. If we are to make any useful contribution to youth community, we must make the effort to understand, at least in part, and certain knowledge we will get it wrong, what youth culture is and what influences it. There is no single entity that can be classed as youth culture. When we see what we see as a culture is in reality just part of society grouped by age. The entire entity we call youth culture is made up of a number of different subcultures. Each subculture has its own set of characteristics that allow it to be identified. This does not mean that subculture is unique and exclusive. It is possible to be part of more than one group. It is not difficult to find emo nerds, and it is certainly not difficult to find geek rockers. It must also be noted that sexual, uh, sexuality is not a defining characteristic of any subculture. Just to confuse you, while, it is, while there is a gay, so a gay culture, it is not exclusive to homosexuals. You do get, get uh, straight in, in the gay culture. I mean, it's just, you know, they are straight, OK? You know, we're not going to argue about that one. Um, in order to engage in a, with a different culture, it is useful to have at least a basic understanding of that culture. All things have a beginning, and youth culture is no exception. Coleman suggests youth culture started with compulsory, compulsory education. Sending children to school drastically reduces the amount of time that they were spending with their parents and increases the amount of time they were spending with each other. They learn together, play together, eat together. Grouping by age, by age will intensify the effect. Janssen and others argue that the formation of culture is based on terror management theory, which, okay, yeah, fear of our own mortality, fear and management of our own mortality, yeah, I mean, it's probably got something to do with it. There is, agreed, uh, there is a degree of observational support um, for this in the aftermath of the two world wars. The flappers and the mods. The flappers were at the time considered extreme. They were a product of World War I, immediately post-World War I, very, you know, early 20s. Flappers were, were young women, girls, uh, distinctive by their short dresses. Their knees were on show, you know. <gasps> Absolutely disgusting. Bob haircuts, can't do one of those. Drinking, could if someone buys me one smoking and generally a freer view of life are generally considered to be more promiscuous than the pre-First World War community. 
Equally extreme were the mods. Following World War II, a new culture formed in London and spread across the country. It spread very quickly. The mods were as extreme into 1958 as the flappers were in the 1920s. Both groups had lasting effects. Cultures are a result of living beings interacting with one another and as such develop over time. An interesting example of a diverging subculture is punk. A, we probably will look at punk later and, and its divergence because it's a rapidly diverging culture. Once described as a brocolage of almost every previous youth culture in the Western world since World War II, stuck together with safety pins, punk has become a subculture of subcultures. While seemingly to embrace just about every possible outlook on life in one manifestation or another, punk has one common theme, being inherently anti-racist despite being almost exclusively white. As an example of diversity in a single culture, punk is worthy of study in its own right. It seriously is. That's it for now, because next time we're going to continue looking at youth and youth culture and what defines youth culture and its a kind of opposition to adult. And we will look... I think we're going to look at language, I don't promise, but we'll probably look at language and we will look at how the diversity of language and the alteration and use of language in youth culture today as opposed to adult culture is neatly reflected in the Bible. Thank you very much for watching. I hope Hosanna will be back soon. Get me ratings up a bit. Do join in the next one. Keep an eye out. If you've got any comments, we like them. We like some discussion, I think, in, in on this, this one. This is important. This is 21st century now. We've, we've dragged the church out of the 18th century. We're dragging it, howling and screaming, into the 21st century. And we'll see you all next time, whenever that might be. <laughs>